What up guys, I am back again. So I think we're on video number three after my, my paid leave. I paid myself on my leave. I don't know if that counts for anything. This video is also sponsored by Lucky Jack. It's really not, but if anyone from Lucky Jack is watching, I will whore myself out for more Lucky Jack. Um, anyway, we're gonna work out or do something today. I'm not sure, today's Friday. We're doing a um, chest and back push pull workout. So exact same workout we've been doing. Context here is Terrence is literally one week out from getting on stage at the Arnold. So for anybody that's wondering what that looks like, um, exact same movements, volumes a little bit lower from our peak. Peak volume was about three working sets per exercise. We're gonna be down to basically two on everything, maybe even one on his top pressing movement. Um, and so all that, the, the goal really now is to hold on to muscle, not even go, this is the only time, normally one to two weeks out, I actually drop weight a little bit. You know, So he's probably down about 20% uh, weight on most things just because there's no reason to go heavier. Um, at this point in time, it won't help him preserve any more muscle. He's definitely not growing muscle. So really, we're just still getting some contractions in to kind of keep his body used to what it's normally doing. In reality, I always tell people, even if he didn't train from here into the show, he might not lose any muscle, but it would affect his caloric output to a degree it might affect his insulin sensitivity. So for the most part, we just like to keep everything exactly the same, keep his body basically in the same groove right up to a show. So his days, his split will be exactly the same. We'll do the same thing scheduled normally for today. We've got arms tomorrow. He'll even do his uh, pull and push workout Monday, Tuesday before the show. And the only workout that will be slightly different is Wednesday. I honestly tell him based on how he feels, I give him the option to train. So either he takes the day off if he's really just feeling tired and wants to let his body completely relax, or if he feels bored and wants to go catch a little pump, that's literally the only workout. It'll be like go and just move some blood around, train whatever the hell he feels like he wants to train. But it's really completely up to him. Then always taking Thursday completely off. Um, before the show um, and aside from that he'll just pose that'll be the only contractions that he'll be doing that day and then Friday is the show he has the pre-judging and the night show the same uh, day all on Friday um, so anyway today again chest back we actually start with calves and abs uh, that's just been a way that we've been prioritizing calves and abs obviously uh, just put them at the beginning of a workout uh, nothing too taxing two working sets there on each of that and then right into again uh, supersets the whole time of back and lats back and lats and, um, and that'll be it. That's the way we've been uh, kind of worked pretty well this split, this go for keeping a little bit more frequency for his upper body. And, um, and like I said, that'll be it. Everything is a little less volume, a little less weight. Everything will even be a teeny bit short of failure. Isolation work, I don't care as much as the compound stuff. And again, all with the goal with kind of just keeping his body in the same routine that it's used to be in, still getting some muscle contractions, telling his body to kind of hold on to some muscle. Um, but again, there's no point at this point in time to push super heavy. There's also no point at this point in time to do a bunch of fluffy pump stuff uh, because again, his body's not used to that. Um, and if anything, going in and just doing too much fluffy pump stuff could actually potentially produce more inflammation, could actually lead to more fatigue than actually doing the same movement that he's been doing, still relatively heavy, but with a little bit lower volume. So uh, if you guys haven't already, do the YouTube thing. I'm supposed to say that stuff, but everyone's like, I missed you when you weren't on YouTube. I'm back. So do the YouTube thing for me. Share with some people, subscribe, like, thumbs up, whatever. I've also got my very good buddy, Just Jasper, in town now. I've known Jasper since 2007, right? 2007? So that's a long time. I think you feel really old. 15 years? That doesn't sound right. We're old as hell. Um, so he's coming up today. One, he's taking a piece of our equipment out of the gym. So we're donating it to a good cause and he's going to get a workout in with uh, Terrence and I today. It's super fluffy. So he'll come back at some point in time for a leg day when we actually train hard. Uh, but it'll still be a good day. Obviously, him and I can still take our stuff to failure and still train as heavy as we possibly can. And then uh, get to watch Terrence pose and just feel depressed the next time we take our shirts off. But that's the usual for me. It'll just be new experience again for Jasper seeing Terrence and then never feeling good about having his shirt off ever again. But... And you guys too, at home, that's really the goal here. Some people get motivated by it. I just get depressed and cry. <laughs> just kidding. Um, so anyway, I hope you guys enjoy the workout. I'll give you some random crap as we go through per the usual. And uh, let's get after it. All right, guys, I'm gonna give you a couple, another secret tips for calves that aren't secrets at all in any way, shape, or form. I'm gonna say this is akin to um, men particularly have an emotional attachment to bench pressing. And in spite of obvious evidence, they'll bench press, hurt their shoulders, bench press more, hurt their shoulders, get off of a set of bench press and rub their shoulders and not feel their chest. And then they'll say, oh, what, what should I do? And I'll say, stop bench pressing. And it's like, 
oh, like you'll hear like music. Trevor's going to put in some music. Angels, choir, like, oh my gosh, it's an epiphany. I don't know what's wrong with men where they have a hard time not bench pressing. But there's something wrong in people's brains when they say they don't have good calves or they don't have good calf genetics. I always use myself as an example. I have ridiculously high insertions. If you have really, really high insertions like this, where that muscle belly gets all balled up, Terrence has high insertions as well too, you're probably never gonna have the best calves in the world, but you can definitely have better calves. I'd argue most people can even have what people would consider big calves. And again, using myself as an example, I trained calves for probably 10 years before I ever had a compliment on my calves. So again, really people are like, oh, like you got big calves, oh, you just got big calves. No, I did not just have big calves. Again, I worked, that was my first goal with working out. I wanted to look like I actually worked out, which took me about 10 years also. But anyway, people will say, I don't have big calves. And they'll do this thing when I ask them about their calf training. And somehow it's always placed at the very end of a workout. So it's at the end of a long day, often at the end of a leg day. So let's say I've done quads, 8 million sets of quads, 8 million sets of hamstrings. And then you do three sets of 10 with calves at the end. And they'll say, I don't have big calves. I have bad calf genetics. And I'll say, I got an idea. Why don't you prioritize them? And the same thing, like the light bulb will come on, angels will sing, the clouds will open, and they'll have an epiphany, like, oh my gosh. So I say, personally, I remember I was probably 21 when I first started training calves first. I had that same idea. I don't know where the light bulbs were not. I probably heard it from somebody else. Started training calves first. Didn't even really focus more on form or frequency or anything else. Lo and behold, they started to grow. So tip number one, if your calves are a priority, don't have that strange mental block that people have where they stare at the obvious answer to address first. Stop training after stuff. Stop training after legs. Legs are your biggest, most demanding body part, your upper legs, glutes, quads, hams. Anything you trained after them, people would never train their chest after leg day and say, oh, I've got a crappy chest. They'd be like, why the hell would you train your chest after leg day? People are like, well, my calves are located somewhere near here, so I have to train them all at the same time at the end. So tip number one, not even getting into form or fancy stuff or programming. Uh, program them earlier on, train them before stuff, then train them as often as you can recover. And I always say number two-ish, I think I said two tips, more tips, do hip-loaded calf raises. So again, I did not say standing calf raises are bad, they're great. Um, I didn't say that seated calf raises are bad, they're great. But hip-loaded calf raises are my favorite just because it takes out moving parts. So again, if I don't have to stabilize my spine, my torso, whatever, it's just less stuff for me to manage. And you will always be stronger. If you ever do, um, Tom Purvis has a thing where he showed me if you ever do a standing calf raise, just with everything, you know, you stabilizing things yourself, and then go, you can see how much weight you can do. If you literally wrap a belt or put something around in the same machine and press your hips into it, you can instantly handle like 50 more pounds. You wouldn't think it'd be that big of a difference, and that's still having your spine loaded. So the amount of weight you can handle here, as opposed to standing, is drastic. And ultimately, that's all your calves care about for growing. Um, so if someone's gonna say, I don't have this, shut up, you're you know, ruining my day. Use a leg press. So in case you haven't figured it out, this is basically the exact same thing mechanically as a leg press. Just imagine this tilted on its side and just put your feet at the bottom of a leg press. So any leg press, plate loaded, selectorized leg press, or if you actually have this dedicated calf machine, that's my top recommendation. Um, if, you, if you have this, I would never do standing calf, calf raises personally. Um, and uh, seated calf raises, I always say as well, two people say seated calf raises work your soleus more. They don't. Um, so they bend your gastroc, technically making that shorter, making that weaker. Your gastroc being weaker is not the same as your soleus doing more work. Arguably, your soleus probably does the exact same amount of work here with a more fixed knee that it does with a bent knee. It just uses your gastroc less, which again, you could make the argument is two things are working and one's working less. Is the other one working more? I don't know. You guys can think about that. Um, so all I mean by that, this is a completely made up ratio, but generally 70 or 80% of my programming, I will do more kind of straight leg calf stuff. And then if I'm going to have someone doing more calves, I might have maybe 20, 25% of the time whatever ratio I said, 30% of the time, doing seated stuff. Again, that's personal coaching preference. That's not some rule written down in stone that you guys can argue about with other people online. When you see someone doing a seated calf raise, you said, Joe said this, you're an idiot. I didn't say that. You heard that. You're an idiot. I'm just kidding. You're not an idiot. I love you. Um, appropriately love you. Only if it's, uh, what's the word for that? You consent to my love. It's only if it's consented love. Anyway, that's a tangent. So anyway, train them first, train them frequent. Train them on this thing. You can do some of the other stuff as well too, but do those things first and your calves will be at least maybe after 10 years of training them. That's not very encouraging, but hey, if you're in it for the long haul, maybe 10 years after doing that, someone will give you a calf compliment as well too.
All right, guys, the two ab secrets. The two are, first off, there's no ab secrets. If you're looking for ab secrets, there's your first problem. Number one, get less fat. So if you're trying to have your abs look good, you have two options, less fat over top of them or bigger abs. Sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Two options, less fat over top of them, bigger abs. That's it, you can't train them to do anything different than any of the muscles. So number one, if you can't see them, odds are you just need to lose more body fat. Two, if you want them to be bigger, like I said, train them like any other muscle. Here's my ab exercises in my logbook. Shameless plug, my logbook. I'm writing down the weight and reps that I'm doing for abs. Isn't that weird? Nobody does that. Um, so if you want something bigger, I program it exactly the same as every other thing. I train them as frequently as I can recover from. Typically do a top set, back off set, and over time I progress them. And then when I'm actually lean, I look at my abs and I decide, are they big enough? There is actually this notion, yeah, your abs could be too big. I don't think I've ever actually seen it. I can maybe think of one pro bodybuilder. What was Abzilla's name? Ooh, yeah, you know the guy that was known? I'll come back, I'll look that up in a minute. There's a pro bodybuilder that was known for having some of the best abs of all time. They were arguably a little bit too big, but you're not that guy, so odds are your abs can't be too big. Um, but in reality, if you get lean enough and you look at them and you're like, oh, they're too big, then you can stop training the same as any other muscle. Secret tip, two and a half. So I said two, but here's two and a half. Use this thing. So this is an ab mat. If I was smart, I'd have a hypertrophy coach ab mat, which I don't, so this isn't a shameless plug. I bought that off of Amazon. I've made the joke before, but I'll make it again because I think it's funny. If you think hard enough about it right now, this will be delivered to your house by the time you're done thinking about it hard. But ab mat, search that on Amazon, Google, wherever, ab mat. Buy the cheapest one you can find because if anybody says there's something better about one than the other, they're lying. Unless I ever make one that says hypertrophy coach on it, then that one's better than all the other ones and buy mine. But until that, just search that. Why is this better than anything else? There's not really alignment issues with rectus abdominis, but if there were, there's no alignment issues here. If we're looking at the things that I like for, um, again, what makes a good exercise. The loading parameter is great. So actually doing a crunch with weight either on your chest or wherever, it goes from heaviest at the bottom, actually a little bit lighter as you come to the top as far as torque at the given joints is. And again, there's uh, bracing and loading. There's no limitation here. So again, you're, literally your bracing is however much you can keep your pelvis and your lower back pressed into that pad, even to the point where if you had enough weight on your upper body, you could just hook your feet under something. So from training economy, simple, cheap piece of equipment to loading to alignment, that is the single best piece of ab equipment you ever need. And you technically don't need more exercises than that. Again, reality, I can't think of a reason to have one to make your abs look any different or whatever. Origin insertion, they get further away, they get closer together. There's nothing else from there. I'll occasionally do some hanging leg raises because I want a little bit of oblique stimulus or some other stuff. Um, but for the most part, this is it. So here's me doing my top set with weight. Now, the only thing a little different is, not gonna lie, a PR on ab mat crunches isn't as exciting as a PR on deadlifts, but I'm gonna have a request for Trevor. He's gonna put the most epic music over this set that he could possibly find with the hardest drops just to make it as exciting as possible. So when you're scrolling through your feed and you see Jordan Peters post some crap about deadlifting 800 pounds, then I'm gonna post this PR right after it. 12 and a half pounds on ab mat crunches. Woo, all right. One other thing to be aware of, guys, if you're gonna load this, which is, uh, again, if you want bigger abs, at some point in time, you should be loading them. Obviously, progression in any way is good. So honestly, progressing from able to do five reps well to 10 reps well to 20 reps well, that's still progressive overload. But like any other exercise, at some point, you might wanna load it. The big thing to be aware of here, I still people, people, I think, sometimes don't even know that they're cheating. Some people intentionally cheat, some people don't know it. Wherever you put the weight makes a difference as well too. Um, so again, how much torque, your muscles don't handle weight, they handle how that weight expresses at a joint in the form of torque. So how much torque you have from a weight is not the same in every position. So if I, at one point in time, this is the PR cheat on this, if I start having it up here, and as I try and get heavier and heavier, or I go through the set, it slides down or it slides down or it slides down, and you find you picking yourself up off your chest or whatever, you're changing technically how much weight your muscle is actually receiving, it's not the same. Vice versa, actually using that to your advantage sometimes. If you wanna make a weight heavier, obviously instead of just putting a heavier weight on your chest, you could move it here. So this weight is heavier on your head, heavier on the back of your head, heavier by your chin than it is right here. When I say heavier, again, talking about torque. The other thing is you could always do it as a way for a mechanical drop set. Mechanical drop set meaning you're able to do more not by changing how much weight is in your hand, but changing the mechanics of how that weight expresses at a joint in the form of torque. So if I get to the point where I'm, uh, I can only do five and I can't 
can't do anymore. I could actually drop this down intentionally to extend the set. I could even move it on the other side of the axis. So again, if the axis is all these vertebrae here, if I put it and I put it over here, then technically this is the same as having a spotter. So this weight now is not actually pulling me into extension. It's actually pulling me into flexion. So I could go from doing, I can barely do five right here, drop it down, do six here, put it in front of me and do another one here. I could drop that and I could even repeat. So body weight here and then using my arms out in front of me. And so again, I wouldn't even consider that cheating. I would consider that a mechanical drop set. And like anything, if you do that planned or intentionally, it can be a good tool. So there's some hashtag pro tip Joe Nuggets for you. All right, I don't know who needs to hear this today, but pull-ups are a fine lat exercise. Um, again, given the context of who, um, what do you have access to, a lot of people will just have on paper, here's what's perfect. Uh, and again, I do the same thing. I think a perfectly fine thing to do, obviously, but a lot of people, you know, one, don't have access to all the same stuff, or two, don't care that much. So you just need to create some context. Um, the biggest thing, in my opinion, for having a little bit more lat biasing is an arm path that tucks at the side. That's probably the biggest factor. Um, so obviously if you can have an arm path that tucks at the side, you know with the machine that goes here, comes down, gets a little lighter at the bottom, nice neutral position, great. A lot of people don't have that. A lot of people don't even have cables. So if you have pull-ups, if you have access to a neutral grip, that can be still be a great option. The only two things that I would modify a little bit if the goal is a little bit more lats, is one, don't crank into the point where your arm's straight on the head. You can actually lean back just a teeny bit and maybe stop right around here, and that'll still put your lats in a pretty good position. And again, people talk about internal moment arms, this and that. You don't have to actually do autopsies to figure that out. You can literally just have to realize where the axis of the joint is. You can see where that muscle belly crosses over that joint. And if there's any distance between that and the axis of the joint in the plane we're moving in, that muscle can do some work. Then the argument gets into splitting hairs. Is other stuff working? Is it working a lot more? Does it really matter? I don't know, that kind of stuff. For most people, it doesn't make a big difference. So that was tip one. Don't come up too high. Tip two, just don't extend a crazy amount. As you extend a crazy amount, your lats can still work, but arguably some of that teres and upper back muscles can work more, which again can be why pull-ups can be a good exercise for upper back as well too. And there's a whole host of stuff in between. So when you're doing pull-ups, lean back a little bit, you know, maybe not too extended, slight extension is fine. You can even go a little bit like kind of a hollow hold. So if you actually tense your abs just a little bit, you can actually be in a pretty neutral spine position. Um, and again, that whole thing comes back to training economy as well too. So not everyone has a good machine, not everyone has cables. Most people have something they can grab a hold of and pull up on. And so again, the idea of saying, here's the perfect whatever on paper is great, but it's also not designed to make people feel like idiots if they don't have access to it, or make people feel like they can't develop good physiques if they don't have access to it. And if you do these properly, same as a lot of other things, you do them well, you do them progressively, you can have some very large lats. And like a lot of things, you know, especially for people that actually have good lat insertions, those muscle bellies insert nice and low, then those are the people that can make almost any exercise a good lat exercise. So that's how some great lats have been developed. Never doing single arm machine, never doing single arm cable, whatever, is again, because genetics can trump a whole lot of stuff. So good genetics, bad genetics, mediocre genetics, depending on your training goals, pull-ups done properly, still a very, very good option for lats.
finish, 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 finish. I'm gonna give, the, give you the goods right away. Goods right away. If you have a machine that is a converging chest press, do not use bands on it. So that's the takeaway. If you just wanna trust me, you don't have to listen past that. Um, again, unless the goal for whatever reason is really to overload the top, which if that's your goal, fine, have at it. But people make the mistake and smart people make the mistake. And depending on if you've heard me say it, potentially out of context, I might've said something somewhere along these lines, but all pressing movements are not ascending profiles. So that doesn't mean, so again, when people talk about profiles, especially for um, a movement that is a compound movement, multiple joints involved. So looking at the way force expresses at those joints, force in your hand, force you know through a platform, force on your back, through a range of motion, you know, we look at how torque changes through those. So normally with a squat pattern, torque decreases. It's the most at the bottom and the least at the top. A lot of people say the same thing about pressing. The thing that people miss about that is the direction of the load. That's really only true when the direction of the load is straight up and down like gravity. So if I'm doing a dumbbell press, that's 100% accurate. It's very true. If I'm doing a squat with a bar on my back, it's 100% accurate. Most people haven't figured out two things here. So one's the direction of load. If a machine is converging, the line of force is not straight up and down. It's at an angle. So you really never have this stacking effect. The line of force to this machine stays the same the entire range of motion. So excuse me, not the line of force, the line of force does, but the moment arm stays the same. So if we drew a line for the line of force being at a slight angle like this, it's the same distance from your shoulder joint the entire range of motion. It's gonna make someone's head hurt, but it's true. So you don't have that change in torque because the line of force does not stack. So what does that mean? You generally don't ever need to overload the top because it's not getting less torque at the top. Lots of times it's as a bare minimum staying the same. Then depending on what machine you have, a lot of the machines are designed to actually have more weight in your hand as you come to the top. So they're already overloading the top, which may or may not be good. That's especially true for most hammer strength presses. The way that weight loads through your hand. If you literally took a scale in your hand and pressed, the weight goes up as you go through. So most hammer strengths are already making themselves heavier than they should be at the top. If you band a hammer strength on top of that, you're continuing to technically make the profile worse relative to what your body can do. Um, so again, all that being said, for what I said in the first part is, don't ban converging presses. That's the reason why. Um, and again, I've added this to my list to draw stuff. So someone's gonna think that when they're trying to imagine this line and they're gonna think it has to get closer to your shoulder joint at some point in time, it doesn't get closer to your shoulder joint. And I'll draw pictures for you later on. Um, and again, this one's a pretty good piece, but this one, because of a couple things, got a lot of stuff going on, gets a little bit heavier at this axis, but all this shit in between here changes stuff. So this works out to be a pretty good piece, but I would never band it for the reasons that I said, because not only is there not stacking occurring, but the other things, this is a really two and a half, number three, is because it converges, you can get to a near fully shortened pec. So lots of times when we're talking about profiles for pressing movements, you don't ever really talk about a muscle length thing because at the top of a squat, the top of a dumbbell press, you know, that muscle is not loaded. With a converging press, the pec, the shoulder joint, the pec is still loaded. So that's basically like the triple threat. If you're on a hammer strength, the machine itself is already heavier. It's already as a bare minimum equal torque the whole way through. If that plate swings horizontally further away from the axis, it's already loading it heavier. And you're coming to a position where that muscle is actually loaded. So if you put a band on it, it's like quadruple dumb as far as if the goal is to match what your body's capable of doing. So there's a whole mess of stuff for you. Enjoy that and look forward to some pictures coming if that's remotely fascinating to you. If that's not interesting and you turned off after the 10 seconds, you're not listening anyway. Don't watch that video because you'll find it boring. All right, guys, got two little tips here for lats. Um, number one is just something hopefully to visually help you guys 
just give you some stuff to think about with lats. Lats has definitely turned into this whole complicated mess of shit. And some of it for good reason, you know, just the basic stuff of any muscle where your hand, your arm is involved, you know, you're trying to keep your arms out of it is a basic start. You can't see the muscles, so sometimes that makes it harder, especially for new people. But also it crosses over so many joints that sometimes people get confused about what can it do, what are its actions. And so all I want to show is give you a visual. Obviously this isn't perfect, so relax, super duper nerds. But your lat attaches at your upper arm and it runs down this way. So obviously we have some fibers on Terrence that you see go this way and then we'll have some that go down kind of towards the hips. And Terrence likely has a nice big meaty lat. So you can literally see these are kind of his lower lat or as the super cool nerds say, the iliac fibers, ah, iliac fibers, whatever. Um, so anyway, the thing I want you guys to see on this is because this crosses over the shoulder joint. So you have the GH joint, how his humerus sits in the side of his scapula, and it also crosses over basically the scapular thoracic joint. So it goes from the upper arm and actually crosses over the GH joint, crosses over the scapular thoracic joint, which is another joint, and attaches down here by the spine. That's the second joint. And technically it crosses over all these vertebrae as well too. So anything it crosses over, it can influence. So it can move the GH joint in isolation. It can actually move your scapula to some degree in isolation. It can actually move your spine as well too. So this is where people get caught up is like, if you read an anatomy book, it's like your lats are shoulder extensors. It's like, well, kinda. And then you have other people say, well, your lat can't depress your scapula. Well, it doesn't directly attach to your scapula, but if it can pull your upper arm down, your upper arm's attached to your scapula, it can pull that down. And to some degree, it's not a prime mover, but it can actually influence spine position as well. So whatever helps you, now if his Terrence was at the top of a lat pull down here, so pull down a row, whatever, just imagine, because you don't have to imagine, this is your lat. If this pulls, what will happen? So again, it could move this just in isolation. It could just pull his shoulder blade down in isolation. But in reality, if I was just grabbing this and I just tugged as hard as I could, what's gonna happen? All of that to a certain degree. So as I pull this down, yes, his shoulder blade's gonna depress. Yes, his uh, upper arm is going to extend. And even to a certain degree, if you have a good feel, he could even side bend just the teeniest bit. So that's like probably the last thing I would mess around with just a little bit. So maybe take this visual next time. Don't overcomplicate stuff. Just visualize a string, a, ra a rope, a band. It has to be this band branded with my name on it, otherwise it doesn't work. Um, but imagine that pulling hard down. Don't overthink anything else. Don't think, ah, GH joint. Don't think, ah, scapula. Don't think, ah, spine. Don't make that noise in any way, shape, or form. I don't know why I'm making that. But just think about that pulling down hard. And if that lat contracts, all that stuff is gonna move to a certain degree. And the only other thing I wanted to show here real quick is if he's grabbing onto this, I have no weight on here, so just to show him. So when people talk about biasing different parts of the lat, hopefully this gives you a good idea. When he's stretched here, if we look at the line of this and the line of his lat, we can see that those are pretty well lined up. So again, I would never say you can isolate this part, but with motions that start or pull up here, whatever can pull in direct opposition of that has the best opportunity to work. Again, if I had two strings here and I wanted to pull this down, would I pull this one or would I pull this one? The one that is in direct opposition has the most mechanical advantage to pull. So again, that's just to give you a little bit of context as well too. Can you isolate these fibers? No. Can you isolate these fibers? No. But if we're signing this line of force up in direct opposition of these, we're giving these ones the best opportunity to pull. So hopefully, wanted to get this brand out. Look at the link in my bio. Look at the description down below. Has to be this brand, otherwise it doesn't work. But honestly, wanted to use this as a little bit of a visual. Hopefully to clarify, clarify some of the mystique and mystery that some uh, experts, not me, I don't know what I'm talking about, um, have created around lat training. Give you something hopefully simple to visualize to help you actually feel, are my lats doing some work? And at the end of the day, that's all that matters. All the rest, you can kind of fill in the blanks. All right guys, so something I hear all the time, I've plateaued, I've plateaued. Uh, what do I do? First off, you're not qualified to diagnose that. You're too emotionally attached to yourself. And if you get emotional about me saying that, it just further proves my point. Anyway, I digress. If you plateaued, first and foremost, look at everything you're doing outside the gym. 
are you doing everything perfect? Is your sleep perfect? Is your food perfect? And not just perfect for a day. One, is it perfect? Two, how long have you been perfect for? How long have you adhered for? Um, because everything hits a point of diminishing returns. People will look at right when they started training, like, ah, I can eat whatever I want, I can do whatever I want, I keep getting bigger and stronger. Well, at some point in time, as the need for stimulus progresses, the need for recovery needs to progress as well too. So most of the time when people say they plateaued, they're not taking the recovery serious enough and they're not adhering well enough. Am I saying everyone has to do that? No, but if you wanna keep making progress, yes. Um, the second thing is, like I said, the longer you're training, stimulus demands increase, but they also go to a point of diminishing returns and that's unavoidable. It doesn't matter if you're natural, enhanced, a genetic free, you do this long enough and everything comes to a point of diminishing returns. Where in the beginning, you know, if you're Jordan Peters, like you one session, you might do a plate on each side, two plates on each side. Why do I keep talking about Jordan so much? Shut up, Jordan, you're in my head. What's that saying? He's living rent free in my head. <laughs> but in a good way, I'm happy he lives there. Anyway, um, so you can't at some point in time keep slapping 45s on, keep slapping 25s on, keep putting 10s on. Um, I talk about this all the time, but I have these things. I have micro plates, I have plate mates. I'm not sponsored by plate mate. I paid way too much money because let's be honest, plate mate, this is overpriced. It's a magnet and you put your logo on it. Make these cheaper anyway, but plate mate. So I'm doing pull-ups um, as an example of something that most people aren't very diligent about. One, if you're doing pull-ups, do you ever weigh yourself doing pull-ups? Do you ever think about that? Depending on your poo schedule, it could be a three or four pound difference. I don't know how big your poos are. Depending on how hydrated you are, depending if you miss meals. So literally, do you weigh yourself before you do pull-ups? If so, how much are you progressing then long-term? Yes, I'm talking about poo schedule, scientifically during a workout video. But what are you progressing then as well too? Most people don't progress their pull-ups. They just do the same body weight all the time and they don't ever go anywhere. But I got my seven and a half kilo Dave dumbbells here and I'm using this to progress because the next progression is a five pound jump. Five pounds, in my opinion, at this point in time might be too big of a jump. So if you're also plateaued, how are you trying to jump? How are you trying to progress? Are you kind of using increments that are, again, going along the lines with that point of diminishing returns? Or are you just trying to make too big a jumps? And sometimes that's your reason for stalling. So to recap, recovery, don't be emotional about yourself, poop schedule, micro plates, plate mates are too expensive. Good talk. All right, guys, just wanna, again, Terrence is gonna donate his big old meaty delt for me for this video, because it's the perfect demonstration. Uh, but whenever I'm doing Y raises, I always get people asking me, is that just a rear delt exercise? 
And I think people get too caught up on motion because like I'm moving backwards, it has to be rear delts. The answer is yes, there's a good mid, a bit of rear delt involved. I always tell everybody this is every head of your delt to a certain degree. Um, but predominantly, depending on how you do it, depending on the angle, depending on how much internal external rotation, for most people, it's actually a little bit more medial delt with, again, some rear delt, some side delt, some front delt. So again, if Terrence raises up to the top position, actually not even the top, sorry, Terrence, right here. So the way I always say is if you actually imagine the angle that this is passing through the joint, wherever it's passing through, whatever muscle belly it's passing through is what can technically work the most. So if I go basically, this is a similar angle, and I pass that right through the humerus. So basically where this goes right in line with where this basically bisects is what's working the most. So lining those up about like that, we actually see if we took this down the humerus a little bit, it's kind of lining up for Terrence pretty much right through his medial delt. And then basically what's on either side of it can work um, a pretty good amount as well too, kind of if this is the axis of motion here. So basically everything on this side of this axis can work. So basically this part of his delt is working. So again, a lot of rear delt, a little bit of front delt, but passing mainly through the medial delt. Thanks, Terrence. And so that's what I just want to demonstrate. That can be tough for someone to visualize, but if you look at the angle of the cable, that's the thing that is helpful, and basically took that angle of the cable passing right through the joint, which was the point of this, to see the angle of the cable, how it passed through the joint, or how it basically passed right through the center of the humerus, anywhere where that load is going through to get to the joint, you can get a better idea of what's doing the most work and what can also contribute. All right, guys, so that's a wrap on today. Um, I saw a little pose in the Terrence in there as well, too. One week out, ready to go for sure. Um, and again, I, th I think I ran through everything. Obviously, we started with uh, calves and abs. Uh, then we had a press, we had a pull movement. I did pull ups, Terrence did a single arm pull down. Uh, the only reason I've switched to that recently is I just want a little bit more upper back involved for me, and, and I kind of like doing pull ups, so I just felt like ch changing them in for a little bit. And then supersetted to a pull down variation, pec deck, um, obviously, still lats, more lat focused than chest and then finish with a Y raise, a uh, little bit more delts involved there as well too. So I always give a little context here. You know, people are always like, oh, should, should I spend as much time doing like those smaller isolation movements? I think referring to like the pec deck, um, you know, and the pullover. Uh, I mean, the main reason we have those as well is because we have a full push day, we have a full pull day where we're hitting back and chest hard. So if we're gonna add a little bit more frequency in, we just can't have too much to, um, you know, recover from overall. So it's like we're not gonna have huge or very taxing uh, movements for back 
very taxing movements for chest, or not a, at least all of them. So that's why we start with a heavy compound pressing movement, you know, a heavy pulling movement, pull down movement, and then go a little bit more isolation work, a way to still get stimulus on those muscles, again, without too much tax on recovery. And just probably about five or six weeks out, decide to add just a little bit more delt volume for Terrence. We've had those kind of deprioritized a little bit, because um, honestly, after a couple years of prioritizing them, they got giant. Um, and now basically we just kind of touch on them towards the end. You know, that's really all we need to do to have them looking good. So that's it. Hopefully you guys found some good information, something helpful per the usual. If you liked it, please do the YouTube thing. Like, subscribe, tell your mom she needs to get jacked. And um, if you got questions, hit them down below. Till the next one.